We really hope that this evening is an opportunity for us to build community, to get to know one another, uh, to get to know our neighbors, um, and to really to, to make Issaquah an even better place than it is, make it more welcoming and more inclusive of all. Um, and so with that, we really, really hope that, and I have no doubt, that all the comments, questions are gonna be positive, they are gonna remain positive, and, but please, feel free to be curious, um, ask questions, and it's okay to ask difficult questions. Uh, we just ask you to be supportive of one another. And so with that, again, thank you. It is my honor to introduce Mayor Mary Lou Pauly to make some welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, you're amazing. So we have one more little technical item. We have tables and we have chairs, but there's no assigned seating, and the best seats are up front or at your speaker's table tonight. So please come forward and join. Lots of room for everyone. Welcome to the City of Issaquah's first Juneteenth event. Uh, my name is Mary Lou Pauly, and I am the mayor of the City of Issaquah. I want to share a few thoughts with you on this amazing event and celebrating Juneteenth. So first off, welcome. I'm glad of all the work that was done to make this special event happen and really want to do a big shout out to our equity board, which has really only been with us less than a year. I wonder if the first thing we could do is just have all the equity board members that are here stand up. opportunity with open arms and have been doing amazing worse work since they have first sat down and getting to understand the city the community and where we need to go and what we need to do so thank you all so much the equity board was created in 2021 and the goal was to support and cultivate the voices of the diverse communities in Issaquah by advising the mayor the city council and the city departments on the city's plans and policies, regulations and programs related to equity initiatives. Here in Issaquah, we made the commitment to work together as a community to recognize racial bias and racism and to make changes to eliminate the disproportionate damage it is doing to our community members of color. And as such, the Issaquah community is committed to listening to a diverse range of opinions, stories and perspectives to continuing the dialogue and sharing what we've heard, and to implementing change as a community. Therefore, we must come together in our community conversations and ensure that everyone has a voice that is heard and ensure that we act with diligence and rigor. Earlier this month, I issued a proclamation proclaiming June 19th as June 19th Day, and I called on residents to eliminate prejudice and to join me in this celebration. And therefore today, I would like to invite all of us to reflect on why Juneteenth is and should be an American holiday, to reflect on the meaning of Juneteenth as the day when enslaved African Americans in Texas were informed by Major General Gordon Granger that they were free, ending 246 years of slavery, and to acknowledge the evils of slavery and its aftermath, and acknowledge African American contributions and achievements within this community, both past and present and to celebrate our African-American community members. Let us commit to working together toward racial equity in expanding economic, educational, and career opportunities for everyone in our community. It took a lot of people to come together tonight to invite our speaker down to address our community and to put this event together, and I'm very grateful to all of you. Now I'd like to introduce, introduce our deputy chair, Tony Curry, to come up with some opening remarks and to introduce the guest speaker this evening. Tony. 
Thank you, Mayor Pauly. Uh, it's so great to see all of the smiling faces here. Um, Juneteenth absolutely is an American holiday. It is not a holiday to be celebrated in one part of the country or another. It is for all of us to share in that. That's why I love seeing all these smiling faces here celebrating this great American holiday. Um, the Equity Board would not exist. Mayor Pauly is very, very gracious. The Equity Board would not exist without her. So thank you for making this happen. Your leadership is what most of America, most of the world needs. And so thank you, Mayor Pauly, for everything. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, an all-around great man, Delbert Richardson. So Delbert Richardson is the owner and curator of the national award-winning American History Traveling Museum. And the unspoken truth with the, with the use of authentic artifacts and storytelling Mr. Richardson will engage us today in a thought-provoking dialogue on why Juneteenth absolutely is an American holiday. Please welcome Dr. Richardson. Give me a hand, pull me. Oh, thank you, man. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I see what you read? That's good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, my name is, first of all, could everybody just take a deep breath? And now what I would like you to do, rub your hands like this, and then point them at me. That's to give me some love. Because I need some being in Issaquah. <laughs> just going to start it off the way I, you know, this is the way I roll. Uh, and I want to just thank Monica for calling me or emailing me or texting me. I don't know how she got a hold of me. You can put your hands down now. <laughs> okay. You follow good direction. I appreciate Monica reaching out to me uh, by email. And I've never met her before. And I believe, Monica, that you heard me do a virtual presentation. And... I believe that she was inspired in a way that she wanted me to come today for this event. So please give Monica a hand. And, and the reason why I'm saying that, who here has ever experienced my museum in person or virtually raise your hand? Yes. Thank you. The reason why I'm saying that, because the work I do is really an experience. Um, I'm here to keynote, but I normally have 14 tables behind me with primary resources, with storyboards, and me taking people on a journey chronologically. That's not happening today. But what is going to happen today is that I am going to take you on a journey of, um, you know, who, who has a slide deck? Anybody have control of the slide deck? So could you put that slide up about conversations about race? Because I'm a, just so you know, my museum is a healthy space to talk about difficult conversations. What do you think that conversation pertains to? Race. I can't hear you. Race. Yes. Remember what I said, my museum creates a healthy space to talk about it. Because there are unhealthy ways to talk about it, right? We all know that one, right? So the question becomes, what does the healthy space look like? So, you know, I have a half an hour or a little bit more. And so one of the things that I'm always looking at is language, verbiage, and what's being presented, and if I can add some information to support this, right? So I saw this, and y'all done a great job with the flyers, the print work. When I see this race conversation starter, I'm asking a question. A great question would be, when's the first time, when's the first, it may be up there, and you can, who put this together? Monica? 
This is great. So everything's a teaching opportunity. I love people giving me constructive feedback. So one of the questions, if it's not up here, when's the first time you noticed race? Right? Or here's another question. Have you heard the term colorblind? Yes or no? So I'm willing to assist, right? Because what I am grateful of is the courage Monica had to bring me, because you must have courage to bring me, make it real clear, because I create healthy spaces for difficult conversations. So I, I see that there are, there are babies in the room and, and younger ones in the room, and my work is primarily geared for pre-K to 12th grade students with an emphasis on black and BIPOC boys. Why? I operate from a belief they're the ones most impacted by racism. Now, he who tells the story controls the narrative, right? Would y'all agree with that? Yeah. Great. So if I can, I would like to actually just, just do an exercise that I do in the schools. Now, everything I'm getting ready to expose you to, I do it in the schools. So this is not a trick question. What continent is Egypt in? Africa. I told you it wasn't a trick question, right? <laughs> so that's true. On the 5 o'clock and the 11 o'clock news, how do they frame Egypt? Where do they put it? Middle East. Middle East. Got it, got it. You guys are warming up, right? So here's the question. It gets a little bit tougher. Is the Middle East a country? No. Is it a continent? No. What is it? So you guys hear all that? So here's the real question. My brother, who has a right to take a country out of a continent and create something. Yes, but we're gonna get back to he who tells the story controls the narrative, right? I want you to hold on to that theme and I'm gonna give you a couple of other things just to hold on to because I'm gonna I'm weave in and out of language and words and I'm gonna challenge how we've been socialized, how we've been indoctrinated, our belief systems. So, who's ever heard of the game Jeopardy? These are not tough questions. Okay. Who likes to play Jeopardy? Great, so great. Here we go. Okay, you ready? So, and it's, this is all related to my presentation and my, my pedagogy or the way that I educate. I'm not a teacher, I'm an educator. I think there's a difference. And I, you hear me say belief quite a bit because you're entitled to your own belief. So I'm speaking from the eye. So I believe that a teacher, and are there any teachers in the room? Any teachers? Now, this has nothing to do with you. <laughs> so, you know, remember I said, I believe, right? But if it, and I always say this, if it lands on you personally, let's talk about it because it is personal. So s teachers, broad brush, have a responsibility of presenting information, guiding students through the information, giving them a test, and then giving them a grade. Does that sound about right? And that's, to me, a Eurocentric methodology of teaching. Sit down, right? Sit up straight. Johnny, stop twitching. But there's a cultural piece, and the two people that raised their hand, I know, I know you. I know you. I know your, I know your cultural identity to a certain degree. And I know that you're relationship oriented, right? Right? But schools aren't. They aren't. So where am I going with this? An educator creates a space with this critical inquiry where they can ask questions. 
there's no judgment and there's really no right or wrong answer. It's basically, let's come together and embrace some ideals around a, a given area. And then based on what this group decided, we'll move from there. See, that's an educator. So what I'm getting ready to do is take you on a Jeopardy journey. You thought, I forgot about Jeopardy, huh? A Jeopardy journey, right? So, um, I, was, I was born in 1954. I'm 67 years old. Yes, I look darn good for my age. <laughs> I can't hear you. Thank you for the tea. So, in 1954, what was what significantly happened in America in 1954? Ding, 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 ding. See how that works? She said Brown v. Board of Education, right? So, which is important. Now, on my birth certificate, one of my dearest friends, Cynthia, is here, who I love dearly. Can we give her a hand, please? You know how I do this, right? She came from Seattle, right, Cynthia? To support me. That, when I talk about relationships, when I talk about relationships, that's what it looks like, right? So, on my birth certificate, I would imagine it said colored a Negro. Have you guys heard that term before? Yeah. That's not an endearing term, by the way, right? But where I'm going, just a socialization, just imagine this labeled Negro boy growing up and his only social media at the time are three types. What social media was in 1954? TV, radio, TV, radio and newspaper. Now, for you young folks, wasn't no cell phone, wasn't no, wasn't no email, iBox, e, e, none of that. So just so you know, once upon a time, our social media was the TV, the radio, and the newspaper. So let's talk about the television. So just imagine me sitting in front of television, watching shows on a regular basis, and being socialized. What does it look like? Who's ever heard the, 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 the show Tarzan? Okay, great pick it up now. So what was the actor's name that played Tarzan? Bing, ding, 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 ding. Buster Crab's the name, but it was Johnny Weissmiller. Well, I want to show you how socialization happens. Johnny Weissmiller, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume he identifies as a white male, right? Bonus round. What Olympic sport did he play? Yes. Ding, 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 ding. So this is the premium round. What medal did he own? Did he, did he get? Guess Stop guessing. <laughs> but how about if you were to guess a medal, what would it be? Gold. You're darn right. But, but listen to what's going on. You got a white guy in Africa, Olympic swimmer, gold medalist, talking about I'm king of the jungle. <laughs> and everybody that looks like me has skirts on talking about Ooga Booga. So why would I want to socialize? Why would I want to associate with that, right? Here's the last one. Who's ever seen the movie Cleopatra? Right. Who played, who played Cleopatra? She ain't black. <laughs> she ain't black. She's not Greek either. So the point I'm making is those are my two socialization, my, my two indoctrination of the African part of my African American name. I went to the University of Washington in 1973. I was transformed because it was mandatory to take an African American class. Mandatory. Mandatory. Yes. But here's the thing, I was transformed and a transformation looked like this. From a caterpillar to a butterfly, you can't go back. From a tadpole to a frog, you can't go back. Oh, and yeah, there's that pick on that cucumber thing, right? But, but the point I'm making, I was transformed because 
when I was raised in 1954 and in the 60s, if you call me black, Cynthia, what are we going to do? We're going to fight because we were socialized that black was a bad thing. You see how this is playing out? Tarzan, Cleopatra, the color black. But the transformation happened on the campus of the University of Washington in 73, which is eight years after the assassination of Martin Luther King. There were students from all over the United States saying, I'm black. I said, what's wrong with them? Because now they're pushing up against some beliefs of mine that black's a bad color. But what I learned, Cynthia, that they had made a decision that they were going to decide how they were going to be seen. And black was an affirmation of self. I know y'all heard James Brown's song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. But that's what that was associated to. So now let me help, help the group here, okay? So I've been transformed. I identify as black African American so, so I can as associate with the crowd intimately. If you identify as black or African American, raise your hand. If you identify as black or African American, I see you, 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 I see you. If you identify as Latina, a Latino American, raise your hand. I see you, I see you, I see you. How about Native American? I see you. How about African immigrant? If you're immigrant, I see you, I see you. How about biracial, triracial? I see you, I see you, I see you. Latina, Latina. Oh, Pacific Islanders. You raise your hand. Whew, almost forgot you. I see you. The reason why I do that, this is what I learned, is that if you identify as black, African American, oh, I'm sorry, Asian American, raise your hand. I'm so sorry. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. The reason why I do that, what I've learned, all those groups that raise their hand, we have a hard time being seen in white spaces. So when I say, I see you, I see me, right? When I say, I see you, I see me. And so I'm affirming me by seeing you and I'm affirming you. And what happens, we start to make that connection in white spaces. Oh yeah, if you identify as white, raise your hand. I see you also too. <laughs> so I do, this in, I do this in classrooms, you know why? Very seldom are our children asked how they want to be seen. You see, I mean it's simple. And the teachers, I would do it as an exercise, right? Just ask them how you identify, and you can do that. Or I, you, I could say, ask how do you identify ethnically? Right here, mm -hmm. Candy? Yes. How, how do you identify ethnically? Caucasian. Got it. How about you, Robin? Caucasian. Caucasian, she's chewing. How about you, Mayor? <laughs> hmm. Uh, hmm. Irish. Irish, yes? Swedish Irish. Swedish Irish? Irish. White. White. Middle Eastern? Gotcha, gotcha. So the point I make, so let me just ask this question. Is white ethnicity? No. no. But here's the thing. You get to choose how you want to be seen. So the question I would ask, if you identify as white, where are your ancestors from? Scotland. Great. So here's the question. <laughs> See, he knew that. But here's the question. Why race is a social construct, would you agree? Absolutely. Which means it's basically based on colorism. And what happens, we get so hmm, indoctrinated into the boxes, we disconnect from our ancestry. And we adopt whiteness because guess what? A whole bunch of privileges come with white, right? Would you agree? Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah. Got it. So these are some of the things I do in school because I operate from the belief if I can provide her 
with some information early enough and she becomes curious, these your children? Yep. She'll develop her own beliefs. And I think that's what you want, right? You got a voice, don't you? Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> but here's the thing, if we don't create healthy spaces, and I know, I, I, I have four, they're adults, right? And I know, how old are you? She's 12. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing. Can we give this amazing scholar a hand, please, here? So, now let me, can I get on with the, can I get on with the keynote now? <laughs> but this is what I do. I come into this space and I show up. Cynthia knows me. I'll show up. None of this is scripted. Because I'm spiritually led and I've been called to do this work. And that's why Monica had me come here. I think. <laughs> so, now, listen to this. In preparation for this, I struggled, put that mic down, I struggled with coming over here. Can I be honest? Great. Now, this is important. I always say this. If whatever I say lands in a certain way, you take it personal, just call me. Because I think it's important that we have these dialogues around discomfort. Now, let me tell you why I struggled coming over here. In the 60s and the 70s, Issaquah wasn't, a, wasn't a, a safe place. Neither was Bellevue, neither was Kirkland, neither was Redmond. We were pretty much told not to come over here. I wonder why. Any idea? Got it. I think you're getting, getting the drift, right? So let me just share one story about Issaquah, and then I'll move forward. I was hoping there's a young lady that runs the Issaquah Museum. And she, you know what I'm talking about? She reached out to you about a month ago because she wanted to do a collaboration because she is speaking truth to power as a white female, meaning she has courage. How do I know that? She was down in the basement, looking around, and she ran across a primary resource. And the primary resource looks like this, a diary of a Klan meeting. That's the primary resource. She also ran into some, some, um, some memorabilia, right? But there's also an article. Who's seen the article about the Klan in Issaquah? Yes, yes. So if you, if you haven't, who's on the, who, you, you know about it? Yes. Great, so what I would like you to do, this, and I'm serious, share it with everybody. Because yes. it's important that you know. Now, I'm not saying that's the way it is now, but the question is, if that's the way it was, where are we now? Where are we now? So I appreciate the equity board, but I'm going I'm, I'm to ask a favor. Any, anytime you speak about equity, please lead with the word race. Because what get happened, and, and this, is, this is what I've learned, is that we get marginalized in equity, diversity, DEI, all those boxes. But when you say race, you're leading with intention. That's so important. Because when you racialize it, it's drop the mic time. And that's the discomfort you must want to in, in, in embrace. So, can I get on with the, the keynote now? <laughs> so I struggled, and I'm gonna talk to Cynthia because I love her like a sister. I struggled with what am I going to talk about, right? It's Juneteenth. Actually, it's post-Juneteenth. It was yesterday, and I really applaud Monica and his group having it other than on the check the box day. Right, Cynthia? Because in Black History Month, everybody does stuff in February, right? What about January, March, April, May? I'm going to stop right there. So this is the 20th, right? So I struggled with what to talk about. And what came to mind is Frederick Douglass. Why? If you're not aware, 
I'm going to give you some nuggets for you to do your own research. If you're not aware, I want you to Google Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech. You know about that? So check this out. They didn't know who they were inviting, did they? Let me give you some context, right? Just like Monica knew who she was inviting. Y'all might have not have known. Let me give you an example. So context. Frederick Douglass is um, in the North. He's in New York. The North at this point has abolished slavery. 1808, 1809. So this is... 1852, when was the Emancipation Proclamation signed? Right, so this is 10 years prior to that. So you got these white abolitionists talking about the 4th of July. And guess what, Brother Fred, will you come speak about the 4th of July? And Frederick Douglass said, I gotta put this mic down. Basically what he said, and actually, his speech is 42 pages. I'm not going to bore you. I'm going to pull out a couple of excerpts, right, to put this in the context. Because this is how I'm showing up, right? Because I believe the uh, flyer said, why Juneteenth the holiday? I would put a question mark after it, right? Here's the question, why not? Why not? I'm, I'm going to give you some context. So Frederick Douglass, in 1953, he's a, the foremost abolitionist speaking out against enslavement. These white abolitionists invite him to a, to a conference. He says, why the heck y'all, I was going to curse, why the heck y'all invite me? Because my people are still enslaved. So he went in on them. 42 pages. So let me share just a couple of things. Eloquent writer, but he's humbled because he can't believe they invited him to this large gathering, right? So I'm just going to read a couple of things, okay? So on page, my page two, which is actually page three, he says, fellow citizens, I shall not presume to dwell at length on the association that clusters about this day. I'm talking about 4th of July. The simple story of it is that 17 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people in which you now, glory was not then born. So what he's saying, you're celebrating 4th of July, but 76 years ago, you were colonists or you were the other. Are you following me? He then goes on to say, you were on the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government at the home of the government, government and England as the fatherland. This home government, you know, although a considerable distance from your home, did in the exercise of its maternal prerogatives imposed upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, limitations, and is in mature judgment it deems wise, right, and proper. So what he's saying is that you were oppressed also too, merely 76 years ago, and you have the gall to invite me? You have the, adapt, the arrogance to invite me? Well, let me help you. So he goes on, page three. He says, feeling themselves harshly and justly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redness. They petitioned and, re and demonstrated. They did so in a respectful and loyal manner. Their conduct was wholly exceptional. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign's indifference coldness and scorn, yet they persevered. They were not the men to look back. So I'm, I'm, I'm painting a picture for you. So now I'm going to read something to you to put this into context. I have primary resources. I have, I have a copy here, and you can look all this up. 
because people tell stories. So this is called a true copy of the Declaration of Independence, okay? And what it says in the bottom here, it says that part which is printed in italics was rejected before it was adopted by Congress July 4th, 1776. So in other words, put this in the context, this is a draft. Now, I just told, I just read to you what Frederick Douglass was saying about y'all was being marginalized, y'all was in restraints, and now y'all free. And y'all want me to speak? Let me put it in the context. Before the Declaration of Independence was signed, Thomas Jefferson and his boys were one of the colonies. So he said, Thomas, you're the best writer. Why don't you co create a draft? Because we know for a fact we want our own independence. But guess what? We don't really have the skills, so you draft it and bring it back, and we'll proof it. Sound familiar? So let me read to you what Thomas put in that was taken out, okay? This is Thomas' words. So when Thomas says he, he's talking directly to the king of England. Now remember, all they want is their independence. Because they're being taxed, taxation without what? Yes. So now check this out. These are Europeans. There's no Native Americans. There's no Africans involved. These is all white folks. Are you feeling me? So this is what Thomas wrote. He said he, he has incited treasonable, listen to these words, he's talking to the king, he has incited treasonable insurrections of our fellow citizens with the allurement of forfeiture and confiscation of our property. In other words, <laughs> in other words, you're coming over here running stuff and taking our land. He then goes on to say, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him. Talk about the slave trade. Captivating and carrying him into slavery on another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death on their transportation dither. Transatlantic slave trade. Now here's the part. This piratical warfare, he's calling the king a pirate. The aporium of infidel powers, he's calling him an infidel, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep open a market where men, bold letters, capital, should be bought and sold. So in other words, there's more. So he's basically saying, for me to make my best case, I need to point out that they're involved in the slave trade. And guess what? That's not right. And we know that you're doing it. And we want you to give us independence, right? So Thomas brought it back to his boys, right? He said, Thomas, we got to take this part out. They said, why? Well, we have to free our, our slaves tomorrow. They all were slave owners. They said, well, oh, well. We're not doing that. So we're striking that from the Declaration of Independence. Look it up. So I'm sharing that with you, just to put it in the context. These are, this is European and Europeans. Blacks and Native Americans not even involved yet. So now getting back to Juneteenth. Am I about at a half an hour? <laughs> Eighteen sixty-five. Let me share just a couple things, and I'm, and I'm gonna let y'all go. Eighteen sixty-five. Who wants to play Jeopardy again? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. You do? Yeah. See, when the children talk, I know I'm in the right place, right? So, so I got one for you. I got a good one for you. Okay. Okay, who said four score and something, something years ago? Great. Who said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal? Great. Who said this? 
There is a physical difference between the white and the black race, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together. While they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I as much as any man am in favor of having superior position assigned to the white race. Who said that? Who? Was it Robert Lee? <laughs> Lincoln. Give him a hand. Now, now that you know who it is, what, what title did, did Lincoln, let me help you out. He's called the Great Emancipator, right? Let me read again now that you know who wrote this, okay? There is a physical difference between the white and the black race which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together. While they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I as much as in any man am in favor of having a superior position assigned to the white race. That is y'all's Abraham Lincoln. He ain't mine. Context is everything. He's running for, he's running for president. Now, Republicans are what the Democrats are now, just to put into context for, for you history people, right? The so Republicans was the Liberal Party at the time, but Lincoln was a Republican, but he knew he wanted to win, so he wanted some Southern votes, right? So why don't I write something to appeal to the Southern base? You see how politics work? He who tells the story controls the narrative. I wanted to share that with you. So the last thing I'm going to share, if I can, three things. And I'm, and I'm going to turn it over. I am a, a educator that used different modalities. Here's a book. This is off the internet. But let me read something to you. Because we're talking about Oh, race is no longer there. We're talking about race. So uh, what grade do you teach, Laura? I used to teach middle school. Okay, great. What, what grade do you teach? Uh, high school. Perfect. Do you know about Robert Ronald Takaki? Howard Zinn? Got it. So he's the equivalent to Howard Zinn, but he's Asian American. So to give you some context, who knows about Howard Zinn? Raise your hand. Jewish guy, unapologetic. Read his book. So what I want to point out, because we're talking about race. We're talking about race, right? And it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me too, right? So on page four, and I'm a, your kids are doing amazing. Can we, give the, can we give the children a hand, please? So let me read. So context is everything. Page four, Ronald's in New York. Who's been in New York? Taxi cab. Who's been in taxi cab in New York? Got it. So Ronald's in New York in a taxi cab. He's Asian American. So he gets in the cab, and the assumption is, is that whoever it is driving the taxi cab is impressed with his phonics. You know how they say, Cynthia, y'all um, talk, talk proper, right? Like we're not spoke, look at my man here, right? Like, wh wh what do you mean talk proper? So in other words, back to Ronald. So this guy is looking at Ronald in the rearview mirror, he, and you know, cab drivers strike up conversations, right? But he's kind of curious about my language, how well Ronald speaks. So what Ronald says, he saw me through a filter what I call the master narrative of American history. According to this powerful and popular but inaccurate story, our country was settled by European immigrants and Americans are white. Race, in quotations, observed Toni Morrison, has functioned as a metaphor necessary, and this is in quotation, to the construction of Americanism. In the creation of our national identity, American has been defined as white. 
Not to be white is to be designated as the other, different, inferior, or unassemblable. The master narrative. So I teach history through an Afrocentric lens. That's not the master narrative. So who here is from Irish descent? Raise your hand. Irish. Okay, great. German. Is that Debbie Lacey? Damn, darn, almost cursed. D darn you. Um, Italian, Polish, Jewish, just so you know, in the 30s and 40s, there were signs that say you're not allowed. You were oppressed, just like me, because you weren't part of the dominant European construct. You were from the Eastern Bloc. Monica, right? So you were othered. So the question is, how would you move from being oppressed and othered to white? Well, it goes like this. Whiteness was invented. You see that? <laughs> and so what whiteness did, they needed more people to be in that category. So guess what? We're going to allow you to join our club, Germans. We're going to allow you to join our club, Italians. And hey, you Polish, come on, bring in Irish. That's how this evolved. And so now, this is important, you have the dubious luxury of calling yourselves white. And guess what that comes with? A boatload of privileges. This is the point I want to make. Two points. You can't give it away, but what you can do is share it and use it as a tool for those less fortunate. So I always ask the question, if you identify, raise your hand if you identify as white. Raise your hand if you identify as white. I'll come out there. <laughs> so the question is, how can you use your privilege to benefit other people? Like me, like my children here, like other people. That's what this is all about because they were abolitionists during the enslavement period. Abolitionists that risked it all for humanity, not race. There were white people, my language, during the civil rights era that risked it all for humanity. So I want you to ask yourself the question, what are you willing to give up and lose? I don't want, we don't want it all, just a little bit. But the unfortunate thing, I'm gonna talk in, in general terms, white male patriarchy operates on a zero sum game. It's either all or nothing. And I ain't sharing. I'm taking my ball. I'm going home, right? But all we're asking you to do is share. We ain't asking for it all. Share. You're not even going to know it's gone. <laughs> but if you socialize through a zero-sum game, I must have it all. There's no negotiating. All right. Juneteenth, the Battle of New Market Heights. The mayor just talked about General Granger, right? General Granger is the one that went to Galveston, Texas to free my ancestors down there. And there's some stories as to why. Some say they wanted uh, another, another yield of crop, so forth and so on. But the story that's not told is that General Granger had a boatload of colored troops with him. Don't believe me. Do your own research. The Battle of New Market Heights. What is, is there any military people here? Military, great. 
What is the highest medal one can get in the military? You darn right. Do you know that 26 colored troops, excuse me, 26 colored men won the Congressional Medal of Honor in the Civil War? Did you know that? Do you know that? You're lucky. I didn't know that. Who else knew that? Why don't we all know that? You know what, you wise ones? I got one for you here. Hold up. You know, I'm good at I want to stump people, right? Where is it at? <laughs> Darn it. Did I bring it? Hold up. Where's my coat? Uh-oh. I feel it. <laughs> Can I ask you guys a question? What are you clapping for? Yeah. <laughs> this ain't the metal. This ain't it, but I'll take the clap. Give it here. Give it one more time. So, I need somebody to do me a favor. You have a cell phone yet? You do me a favor? Did she have a cell phone? Is it on her? You do me a favor? I want you to look up something for me, okay? Please. I do this in school. This is the only, I mean, I have them, I got to meet students where they are. I want you to look up, what's your name? Kelsey, will you look up the Butler Medal? The Butler Medal. And mom and dad, it's okay if I have her speak into the microphone? Is that okay? <laughs> now, now, so here's the question. Kelsey, do I have your permission so you can speak in the microphone? You should have saw she looked, she gave her parents, right? Like, you didn't ask me. She's 12. <laughs> you find it? You think so? Let me see. Yes. Let's see here. I'm sorry, I didn't ask permission to touch your phone either. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So what I want you to do, if you don't mind, you can do it from right there, okay? This is important. Can I get you to help too? You hold this. Can I, can I, can I make them, have them part of the presentation? That's fine. Come up here, please. Oh, <laughs> give my hand. So this is what I do. What we're teaching them is public speaking. I mean that, right? So what I want, you're going to hold the medal up, testing, and I want you to read what the Butler Medal said. Does Wikipedia come up? No, just tap it again. Tap Wikipedia. Are you okay? You nervous? Of course not. <laughs> so this is, this is connected to Juneteenth. Go ahead. Oh, first of all, introduce yourself. My name is Kelsey. Great. Who are you? Raina. Raina, great. Okay, great. Go ahead, Miss Kelsey. Um, the Butler Medal is also known as the Colored Troops Medal and was a military decoration of a unit of the United States Army, which were issued in 1865. The medal was commissioned by the Major General Benjamin Butler and was intended to recognize meritorious or heroic acts of bravery performed by African-American soldiers at the Battle of Chaffin's Farm and New Market Heights. Fourteen Americans had earned the Medal of Honor in that engagement, but Butler wished to, to further recognize his African-American troops involved in the battle, and he paid for the Butler medals out of his personal funds. Thank you, thank you. That's enough, thank you. Good man. So great, have a seat, thank you. So let me, let, oh my God, let me, let me share, thank you. So what she just, what she just did, she just taught, who knew about the Butler medal? Got you, didn't I? Darn it. So, what she just read, guess what? Y'all can look it up. So, I just told you that I think 26 won the Congressional Medal of Honor, but that wasn't enough for General Butler. Because of the valiant effort, 14 colored men exercised, 
He paid out of his own pocket to have a medal commission called the Butler Medal because that's how much he valued them. This is Juneteenth. Thank you, yes. I am gonna close, and I would like to close with questions. And this question is related to reparations. Well, you know, Debbie, I see you back there. You know, Cynthia, what's your name, bro? Tony. Tony, here he go with them reparations again, right? You Darn right. Why? As an educator, I always like to use definitions, right? So we know about slavery and enslavement, right? So let me read you the definition of, of reparations. Then you be the judge if reparations are due, okay? We got this? Got it. So reparations. Payment of a debt owed, the act of repairing a wrong or injury to atone for wrongdoings, to make amends, to make one whole again, the payment of damages, to repair a nation, compensation of money, land, or material for damages. What do you think? Do you think? Do you think reparations should be discussed? Now, if you don't, let me give you a little bit more, and I'm going to close with this. This is one of the storyboards in my museum, and I normally would have them lined up, but this comes out of a book titled, When Will America Pay? by Dr. Winbush. When will America pay? So on the left side, it's a table. It has countries on the left, has dollar amounts in the middle, and, and people that received it. So. The left, the first one's Germany, 822 million Holocaust survivors. The next one, 1 billion, 44 million acres of land for Alaska Natives land settlement. The next one, 81 million Klamath of Oregon. Next one, 105 million Lakota of South Dakota. Next one, 12.3 million Seminoles of Florida. Next one, 31 million Chippewas of Wisconsin. Next one, 32 million Ottawa's of Michigan. Next one, 230 million Japanese Canadian. Next one, 20, 250,000 square miles of land. Eskimos indigenous, I'm almost finished. 25 million Jewish claims on Austria. Last one, 1.2 billion Japanese Americans. There were some Native Americans said, we don't want your money. Give us our dang, darn land back, I almost cursed. <laughs> They said, give us our land back. We don't want your money. Now here's the question. Who knows about precedence? Who, right, pre you do. I know. So precedence means what? It's been done. Any lawyers in here? So in other words, precedence has been set. I read the definition of reparations African Americans and Negroes are nowhere on here. Not even Black Wall Street. So, in closing, white male patriarchy, I gotta speak to you, because that's where it all starts. Zero sum game. Do you want to be right or you want to be human? Being right is based on up here. Being human is doing what's best for the heart. Zero sum game. We don't want it all. We just want what's due to us. Is that asking too much? I don't think so. So I want to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I have a lot more to say but I've said enough, but I just want to leave you with this. Allies, advocates, and abolitionists. I don't do allies, I don't do advocates because you can pick and choose when you want to be in or out. I do abolitionists, why? You've made a commitment that you're willing 
to sacrifice. And guess what? You don't get to choose if you're an abolitionist. I do. We do based on your actions and your deeds. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. While you're standing, I brought these. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. These are authentic slave shackles. See the size of that? That's for a child. Or a young adult. So here's the question. There is this thing called the new Jim Crow where we as black people make up 13% of the population, but 40% of the jails. It's the new slavery. Has anything changed? So I want to leave you with this here. These are real. Let's not go back, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>